And uh, the first speaker for for us in this meetup is now uh, William Kuosmanen from Futurize. And as it was mentioned, uh, that, uh, he's an expert in uh, sucking uh, developer experience, probably the opposite as well. And his expertise, uh, as I heard from the company, I don't know who decided this, is it you or someone else? Uh, but he's, he's an open source evangelist and a propaganda person and uh, complains of stuff about twit on Twitter, active Twitter, and uh, uses Vim, which is, uh, some, some hate it. But anyway, it's, it's, it's an expertise anyway. But uh, let's, let's welcome uh, William on the stage now. On the full screen here. Mode, OK. It does work. OK. That's good enough. Right. So I have to be completely honest with you. Uh, I kind of got this request on Saturday. So basically, I just used this afternoon to cobble something up about uh, API developer experience. But anyways, my name is Filiami, as I got introduced just now. Um, I'm going to talk to you about, uh, well, I already got some introductions. So I'm also kind of known as the anti-digitalist guy, kind of because I, I throw, throw things out on Twitter, and people tend to not like it. Uh, also been featured on Forbes, which is quite nice. And also a claimed security expert. OK. So uh, what I've been doing at Futures for uh, now is, is actually microservice architecture for Kesco, our, one of our biggest customers in Tampere. Uh, so basically just building RESTful APIs uh, on top of other APIs. So why do you want to talk about bad APIs? It's fun, <laughs> and it makes me feel better about myself, right? But mostly because you want to learn from bad experiences and common mistakes. Okay. So I'm just going to go with a story. <clears throat> and this isn't a real story. So any APIs and issues described in the following story are completely fictional. So this is not Gesco, right? And these are a combination of multiple bad API experiences. So not all of it is the same customer. I've just kind of done a fictional story, combined some of those bad experiences. And also, uh, well, yeah, if you happen to notice that this API looks something I know, it's probably coincidental. The, any of the APIs are in the, in the presented oh, here right now, really. Yeah. No, APIs yeah. <laughs> also not that, yeah. <laughs> OK. So the story goes, our, our client says that we have these third party APIs, but we would like you to build abstraction on top of them, which is a bit weird, because you already have APIs. Why would you want to build an like, abstraction on, on top of them? But yeah, let, let's go and find out. It's just going to be integrations, right? Can't be that bad. What did we find? Let's look at the first API. SOAP APIs. <laughs> yeah, cool. I know SOAP. I mean, I learned that in school. It's, it's pretty easy to use, isn't it? Well, no API documentation, of course, because SOAP APIs are self-documenting. You've got the WSDL file. So yeah, that's the first issue right away. So no documentation. It would be good to have at least a readme or something, a few example requests somewhere. Would be nice for the developer. Well, we have the WSDL because it's, it's SOAP. Except no, we don't have a WSDL because it's, it's, it's published somewhere and we just get a URL and try to get the WSDL, nothing. So I have to ask the customer again, the client, where's the WSDL? And they find out it's behind a gateway and the gateway doesn't support giving you the, the WSDL, which is kind of bad because I need that to use a SOAP client. The solution is easy. We'll just email you the WSDL file, and that's fine. I mean, we can work with that. It's, it's, it's fine. It's not optimal, but it's good. <clears throat> so let's set up a SOAP client and just explore the API, because we don't have any documentation. We just kind of have to look at what we got. And this is what happens. <laughs> the first thing that happens is I get an error message that says, target namespace is already used by another schema. I have no clue what that means. Okay. So again, I have to contact our client. And it turns out the WSDL file is just not compatible with my SOAP client library, which I'm using on Node.js. Fine. So it turns out the issue was this. We had uh, two tags that both uh, define the same target namespace. Basically, they just split one, uh, one, ta one definition in, into two lines, two tags, which is a problem on some clients. Some clients know how to handle that. <clears throat> so the solution, 
I just in my code, I, I merge the elements dynamically. Mm -hmm. And if I want to actually read the file and look at, uh, use some uh, graphical user client, I just uh, edit that WSDL file to use it. Quite easy. Not optimal, but workable. Finally, yeah, my set client is set up. I can actually start now exploring the API. So what do we have? We have something called lookup member. Pretty basic getter. So I'm using SOAP UI to generate like these example requests here. So quite simple. So we have lookup member, then a request, like pretty basic SOAP, SOAP stuff. Member ID, so I'm just going to go with one. That's probably going to be something at ID number one. And I get a 200 OK response, but that doesn't look very good. <laughs> right, so post code environment server, right? OK, so apparently it's a problem with the server. It's good to know. And then a call stream that looks like a Java or uh, object, a null pointer exception. That's not very helpful now, is it? So what do I do? Again, uh, well, this is a problem. Uh, the 200 code is wrong, definitely, because we don't want to be checking just the content of the response. And the other problem is it's a bad error message, obviously, because, yeah, null pointers are not very useful. The consumer of the API, maybe the developer of the API itself, but not the consumer. So we have to ask for help again. And since there's no available documentation, had to contact the client via email again to ask for help. It took three days and seven emails to get to the person who was actually able to pro provide any help with this and actually give us a working example request so that I can actually use the API. And finally, it turned out it was just, I was namespacing, uh, I mean, so UI, which was generating this, this request, was actually namespacing the uh, content of the request itself, which, for some reason, this API doesn't support. OK, we can still work with this. Now we get a 200 OK. That, that looks a bit better. I mean, we got a return object, and we get something that looks like a member of something. Maybe. Cool. But yeah, that was a problem. It's quite hard to get help if you have to email your client. Because this is a third party API. This is actually some company selling their API to, to our client. Information available on their website. The API documentation doesn't give you any contact information. So, well, there wasn't any documentation. You maybe want some contact as well. Right. Well, try a setter next. We have got uh, a customer, a member from the database, and now let's try to add one. Again, so Pew, I did this. I had to also remove the namespacing uh, on, on those email request tags and the other property tags. And it works. Awesome. Except that's not the optimal thing you want to see when, when you put something in a database. You might want to actually see what you put in there. So now I actually have to make another request to get the UUID, because I need the UUID for my own purposes. Obviously, I'm going to need that. So again, I have to do a get uh, request. And this is called a chatty API. Chatty APIs are, are, are APIs that actually want you to have as much communication with the API as possible, which isn't a, a very good strategy, because then you have to generate a lot of traffic, and it's, it's slow to actually handle. But fine, we can still live with that. We, I, I guess this is one of the reasons they might want us to do the abstraction on top of their APIs. <clears throat> OK, so next I want to test error messages. So I know that email should be a unique index, so there shouldn't be two different emails in the database. So I'm going to add a duplicate request. So basically send the other, another request again. So that was, that was from in, in our kind of spec. <laughs> we, we, that wasn't in, in the API spec at all, no. Yeah. And we hope that they would implement that. Yeah, we, we assume, yes, that's correct. So what happened? Another 200 OK response. But this time, something different. Yeah. So, so I actually get a fold code, which looks like it might be machine readable. But actually, if you just look at it, it's just it's, it's a gen generic SOAP service fault. So that's not very helpful. And then in <laughs> Swedish. <laughs> but luckily, I do know Swedish. It does help. But why? Why would you do this in an API? It just doesn't make any sense. You want to have machine-readable messages. It's better than nothing. Yeah, it is better than nothing. That's true. But I would prefer it. <laughs> just 
regular US English. Thank God for Parker Watson. Okay, another token method. Let's try one more. So, pretty straightforward. Get member by UUID this time because they're generating UUIDs for those resources in the API. So, the payload looks simple enough. It's just request and it has a GUID property. Okay, seems to work just fine. But there's one little problem here. You might not see it now. Go ahead. Well, it's, not valid. it's not the same as you had previously. Exactly. Right. That's wrapping result. Exactly. And the previous one would return. <laughs> so that's nice. So it's, it's completely like, now I have to handle this in my code. And I'm probably going to spend a day just debugging what went wrong. Because you would assume that two different getters would have the same kind of response object. But no. But yeah, this is really, this actually happened. <clears throat> so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Inconsistent API responses are quite bad. It's, it can be a bit of a nightmare to kind of handle those responses. But yeah, so that was the first API. That was the SOAP one. I guess that was OK. We handle it. It's a REST API. The, the client is telling us it's a REST API, which basically always means it's just a RESTful API. It's never a real REST API. And they even have open API documentation, which is awesome. And Swagger did JSON. Do you guys know open API spec? That's please use it. It's great. And if the uh, iframe would work here, I would actually see see the Swagger UI, but let's forget it. Let's explore it. So we have get pet and an ID. Let's try what it says. Hmm, looks good. So uh, we have an ID, a name, it's lassie. And then we got properties, name, two, gender, female. Oh, I mean, age two. It works, but I mean, it's not very nice now, is it? You just have to write code to actually go through the properties and then look at the name of the property and then get the value, which is just, why would you do this? Because, I mean, this is a pet people mind. I mean, I, I hate passing these in my API consumer code. Because you could just do this. So simple, right? So going from this to this makes no sense to me. I mean, there might there probably is some reason to do that in your own code because your own data structure might look something like that. But why would you expose it that way to the API? Yeah, that shouldn't be the prime force. Exactly, exactly. You you wanna design your APIs for the developers or the consumers of the API. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Let's do a post. So. We have a pet. Obviously, it's, it's not real REST because we're using post here. I mean, you would use put or something else here. But yeah, posting pet. The payload is quite simple. We're adding Garfield there. Cool. And this is what we get. Hmm. All right. Um, that doesn't look too good. So we get a status. It's queued. And a UUID. Oh, OK. So what do I do here? I mean, we got the Swagger documentation. And if I look at it, I find out, yeah, what happened to Garfield? It got lost. Yeah. Uh, it looks like there's something called pet queue. <laughs> <laughs> and I can, I can send my UUID to see what happened to Garfield. So let's do that. Let's, let's just see what happened to Garfield. Oh, uh, status, job queued, another UUID. <laughs> Great. So this is a good example of really chatty API. They just want you to request and poll and poll and see what happens. So I, I basically have to poll this endpoint until I know what happened to Garfield. And 15 minutes of polling later, <laughs> it uh, tells me job is done. There's a UUID and there's a result. And I get a pet ID. And let's see if Garfield's there. Awesome. Yeah. It did work. Really, was that necessary? We just added something in a database, at least as far as I can see. There, nothing happened. Nothing like big. There might be something in the background, but who knows? Well, got a lot of time to eat. Yeah, that, that's probably the reason. It's a human <laughs> yeah, human probably using <laughs> every fifteen minutes going in and writing something now, probably. So, what did we learn from these two small examples? At least we learned why the client wanted to abstract these APIs. <laughs> it's not very much fun to use to use, do services with these. So number one, you want to document your API with examples. You should provide ex executable examples, like just shell commands that you can actually use so you can verify that this 
API actually works really easily. And you want to use this uh, API standards like, uh, well, with SOAP, you'd use WSDL. And with the RESTful APIs, you would use Open API Swagger JSON. It's really useful, as we saw here. Quite simple, return appropriate HTTP status codes. You can just look up on Wikipedia a list of HTTP status codes. It's really not that hard. Just use that. <clears throat> and you can generate uh, useful structured error messages. So don't do Swedish. I mean, it's, it's as simple as that. Just structures. Use something. Use a library or something. Make it easy to get help. And I can't stress this one enough. I mean, everything is kind of forgivable. But if you have to email somebody for five days, three days, it's just not a very good experience for me. Avoid making chatty APIs. Uh, as you guys saw, it's not very nice, is it? You should always uh, have your API serve its purpose in as few requests as possible. Of course, there are uh, exceptions to this rule. You, there, there might be some reason that you actually have to do something like polling uh, some endpoint. But still, you might want to always keep it as, as a small amount of requests as possible. And API responses should be consistent. So name your resources consistently and don't do un unnecessary uh, nesting or, or arrays or something like that, because it's just a pain to pass on the client side. <clears throat> yeah, that's kind of related to the previous one. Simple data structures. Use standards for these things. Do uh, the same thing in, in different places. So go ahead and look at the other examples of good, good APIs. Yeah, that was a, uh, <laughs> I guess we covered that already. OK, so how do I then make a good API? Well, I don't know. Read. <laughs> That's kind of my view on it. Those I, I've myself read them, and really, really good guidelines. Please do check those out. But yeah, thanks. That was it. Any questions? Yeah. Comments, topics? Go ahead.